Hello everybody, Mike with Spray Jones. Welcome back for another installment on spray foam installation and education. My name is Mike, I'm the owner of Spray Jones. I produce content on the Spray Jones YouTube channel for spray foam installation, primarily closed cell foam. We do uh, open cell foam when it suits us, but being that we're in the Canadian cold weather climate, closed cell foam is our primary workhorse. Today we're gonna be taking a look at uh, insulating of metal buildings. Now this is not necessarily going to pertain so much to your post frame structures because a lot of that is wood frame construction and it's just metal clad. When I'm saying metal buildings I'm talking about what we're seeing here in front of us a metal superstructure and then metal purlins and then metal siding. So 100% of the structure is metal. You might wood frame walls or something inside of that but the entire structure is metal. Metal in cold weather climates is complicated to get right. Uh, first and foremost, it's not something that can be done generally when it's really, really cold. So to the northern part of the United States and into, of course, all of Canada, uh, your metal buildings are going to need to be insulated sometime between the spring and the early to mid fall. When you get into late fall or what I would say is early winter, you're going to run into easy condensation issues. Now, yes, there are cold weather spray foams that can be put on at sub-zero temperatures. However, when you are dealing with a very cold metal structure and then you are dealing with a warm spray foam, you can get flash condensation occurring where you hit it with a warm foam at just the right humidity level, at just the right temperature warm up, and all of a sudden you can have moisture developing on the surface that can create issues. So what I generally do is uh, where we are located is come middle of October to late October, that's done. Metal buildings are done until about the end of April again, uh, which is practical. It's easy for the building to develop and have condensation sitting in cracks and crevices that you can't see and then it's in an ice format and then when you hit it with something warm then the water comes out of it and poof, you got problems with the spray foam. So the next thing is, do we want to put closed cell foam to the inside or to the outside? Well, take a look at this detail. This is a uh, recommendations for insulating of metal buildings. It's a fairly generic document. Uh, spray polyurethane foam alliance had produced this in the early 2000s. And I think it's very valuable to see that Okay, if we're going to be putting closed cell foam to the outside, it's a great way of leaving the inside completely uh, untouched, um, warm, and you've got this beautiful virgin interior that you can do anything with. Plus, it, it eliminates the issues of how you're going to get foam into some of these difficult side details and, and corner details. However, the closed cell foam, this is being generous with how this looks in this detail here. It looks fairly smooth. You do not want to have closed cell foam on the outside of a building and then have a coating over top of it because at some point that coating that needs to be UV stabilized is going to break down. It's going to um, need touching up. It's going to need repair. So there's a lifespan to putting a coating. You could put Z girts to the outside and do a double wall to the exterior where the spray foam is going to serve as your rain screen. It's going to serve as your air barrier, your insulation all in one. You're going to leave a hollow cavity to the outside. So basically this Z girt would be to the outside. There'd be another Z girt here and you'd put two, three inches of closed cell foam to the outside and then there'd be an airspace and then you'd put tin. So at that point, you're double cladding it, like you're cladding it to have a substrate to spray to, and then you have your finished cladding. And I think that's really ineffective uh, long term because uh, you're highly weather dependent, wind dependent, rain dependent, uh, roof, all of that sort of stuff. So it's, it's just very difficult to get the building up get it erected, have that double system, have all the lifts on site necessary, and then be working inside the wind and the rain. If we scroll down here, we take a look at more common uh, recommendations for spraying of the foam. Now, what I'm gonna here to discuss today with you is the fact that I don't actually believe that Z-girts need to be fully embedded in uh, foam or or metal purlins. So here you have your metal superstructure, right? This is your structural uh, column. 
and uh, beams. And then the Z-girts are mounted off of that and then the siding. Or I'll, I keep calling them Z-girts, but they're purlins, metal purlins, running horizontally every two feet or every four feet, depending on what the spacing is. What we have found is that when this flange is fully embedded, and I'll zoom in so you can see. When this flange is fully embedded on, in foam, uh, all you will have for conductivity, thermal conductivity, is the thickness of the of the gauge of the metal. So if you're 16 gauge, or it wouldn't be eighth of an inch, but it'd be maybe a sixteenth of an inch or something like that. You're not going to have enough thermal conductivity to the inside to make this sweat. Now, if you got the humidity levels high enough, if you went and poured concrete and you had it saturated and very, very wet inside and it was very, very cold outside, then yes, you probably could get it uh, to, to drip. But under normal circumstances where you don't have ex elevated humidity levels and extremely cold outside, this thermal conductivity through the girt is not enough to form a problem of condensation. And we've done multiple buildings this way. If you are going to add the purlins back into the uh, equation, most of these are 8 to 10 inches deep, plus the flange. You're talking about adding 2 feet of sprayable area for every lineal foot of purlin. And then you start adding that up for what you've got in roof detail and wall detail, and you can end up adding 40% uh, more area onto your total sprayable area so you spray guys out there understand talking to your customers that spraying this detail is really unnecessary even in cold weather climates now the other issue is that this is usually going to be the connection point 99 percent of the time this is the connection point if you're going to want a framed wall or you're going to be doing any interior finishing of wall which i recommend that the spray foam be covered this is going to be the facing that you're going to want to attach your uh, paneling to so as a result, you want to keep the face clean for the roof. Many people put up roof panels and uh, they need the face of the girt clean in order to screw to. Now, when you get into corners and edges, it can be very difficult. You've got a, a structural C channel or a column or what have you that's in there. Make sure these areas where you're not going to be interfering with uh, gyp rock or paneling or, or tin lining on the inside. Make sure these areas are fully embedded. There's no reason not to go over them. You're not entrapping any moisture into the system. So get the flanges and all of the necessary metal uh, sealed. And as you can well imagine, when you have a steel column and a steel support, this is fine when you're spraying 90 degrees from it. But when you're running parallel with it, when you have this at the end wall, this steel column and this steel beam can obscure large amounts of wall and roof intersection. So it can be very, very difficult depending on what the standoff is. If you've got 10 inches or a foot, maybe you've got just enough space to get up inside there. But these can be very technically challenging areas if this is a two foot or even a 36 inch deep um, superstructure that you, and with flanges at the bottom, the flanges will, will cast you off from getting in there. It can be a very deep, um, cavity to try and get spray foam back into there. So there's some very technical challenging areas um, we've had to overcome on large buildings and you as sprayers have to overcome and you have to think those through. You can't just leave these areas. You can't have this area here blank where there's no spray foam insulation or, or a strip down the middle where the spray foam didn't get or the spray foam worst case is very very thin because you sprayed it on an angle maybe only got an inch in there you didn't cover the screws and the nuts and the bolts and what have you and now they're going to drip. So you have to be very careful to get these details uh, sufficiently thick, which begs the argument sometimes the outside of the building is the correct way to go. If you're going to have a very complex building with a lot of metal structure and supports, you might not be able to effectively get it sealed from the inside. So that's something that has to be reviewed. Uh, you can and should be using primer uh, on galvanized or galvalume. Uh, painted steel is good to go as long as it's clean and dry and this foam will stick to it tenaciously. Uh, and as far as this whole, is the foam gonna buckle and bow and push the paneling out? Not under normal circumstances of spraying a two inch lift. If you go and spray, any of the, any of the people that I've seen that have bowed panels out, the panel has either been excessively light and thin, we're talking 24 gauge, 
and has very limited support in the middle. So it's already beginning to oil can and, and, and move. Or in this case of where it is a fairly thick, robust panel, the person came in and sprayed you know, four or five inches at one shot, which is a big no-no unless the foam is designed to do it. But even with the foam being designed to do it, putting an enormous amount of material on at one time, and then you can create enough dynamic forces to start to push the panel around. So we found, as you watched in our videos, two inches of closed cell foam being sprayed, there's no issue. We've never been able to push the panel around and had it uh, buckle and bow. And then the final thing is uh, thermal barriers can go over. Uh, you can spray a whole different, there's a whole mess of thermal barriers or protectorants or colorants. I wouldn't ever just leave spray foam naked and exposed, open to ultraviolet light. Uh, a lot of times people will do 10, 12, 15 feet up of paneling and then from there they don't want the roof done they don't want the rest of the walls done so then getting a really good intumescent fire spray or some type of acrylic elastomeric that has has uh, fire retardants in it or even just something to protect the foam from uv uh, light and degradation is a must don't leave the building uh, just exposed with the spray foam on the inside so there that should about do it for today discussing how we're doing these details fairly straightforward fairly easy to understand comment on the video share like and subscribe we'll catch you on another one